everyone. My name is Jody Lyons, and I'm your host today for Your Need to Know. I'm really glad you're here. And our guest today is Dr. Jasmit Brar, and he is with National Spine and Pain in the Reston office. So you're one of their affiliated physicians. Happy to have you here. Thank you so much, Jody. I'm very happy to be here. Great. So Dr. Brar, can we start a little bit about who you are? And this is one of my favorite questions. Did you always know you wanted to be a doctor? <laughs> no, medicine was a little bit different for me. I approached okay. uh, the sciences initially uh, when I was in uh, high school and pursued neuroscience when I was an undergraduate at University of Virginia. At that time, okay. it was more for spending time in the lab, mm -hmm. you know, working on cell cultures and, and doing research. And then medicine came more to me later on when I decided that you know, time in my lab is great, but I actually want to see patients and I actually want to help people in the community and clinics. So it was a little bit of a transition for me, a natural transition, but um, still nothing I knew at the beginning. Well, that's amazing. So you knew you wanted science in high school. You just didn't know it was medicine as opposed to research. Correct, yes. That's great, because a lot of doctors tell me that they knew when they were five they wanted to be a doctor, <laughs> but I'm finding more and more that isn't necessarily the case. It's true. My parents would probably told you at probably age two I was going to be a doctor, but I didn't know that at the time. There you go. <laughs> they knew that. See, That's so right. they were right. You'll have to go and apologize and tell That's them right. they were right. That's right. So I know you're an affiliated physician with National Spine and Pain. Can you tell me a little bit about what you actually do and where you are and where we could find you? Absolutely. So I'm an interventional pain specialist at National Spine and Pain Centers at the Reston location. Okay. Uh, I joined this practice about five years ago. Um, I came from my time um, up in New York City where I did my uh, anesthesiology residency and pain management uh, fellowship okay. at uh, Cornell uh, Hospital Special Surgery and Memorial Sloan Kettering. So oh, wonderful. My background is a little bit diverse. I spend a lot of time with cancer pain patients, patients with joint replacement uh, surgery that continue to have pain and then patients have had spine pain or other chronic degenerative conditions. So I brought that you know, expertise over here to Virginia and uh, for me it was a bit of a coming home. Uh, I grew up in the area. Okay, uh, yeah. so where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Sterling. Uh, oh, close we, to here. Very close. So I grew up at Potomac Falls, Virginia, uh, not too far from here and uh, it was a bit of coming home after five years away. Um, areas changed but I still have seen wonderful growth in terms of resources of healthcare, mm -hmm. and our clinics have also grown along with that here as well. Absolutely, although big change from New York City, isn't it? It is, it's, you know, but there's a bit to, to say about Southern charm yes. here in Virginia. I think, you know, I've always, you know, had a wonderful experience growing up with, you know, the community here, friends and family, and I, coming back to the area was just a, a natural fit for me. Perfect, I'm glad to hear that, and we're certainly glad you're here. Um, I'm wondering, so I get this question a lot because I'm a geriatric care manager and I get the, so what exactly should I go to the doctor for? Why am I going to the doctor? Give me a reason. What is he going to do? Could you tell me a little bit about why people would come see you and what a visit would look like? What can they expect? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for many patients coming in to see the pain specialist uh, can be a little bit confusing. Are they coming in to see their, you know, their hip checked or their mm -hmm. spine checked? You know, my rationale for patients to come in to see us is anytime anything bothers you, it limits your functionality or quality of life. If it prevents you from going on a walk or playing with your kids or just doing basic activities around the house, right? Preparing dinner or, you know, cleaning around. So those are opportunities for, you know, patients to reevaluate, hey, if this is bothering me, maybe I should get it checked out or take a look at it. If it's a pain, if it's a chronic degenerative condition that's been going on for many years, but it's getting worse, that's yeah. a great opportunity to see a pain specialist. I think we have a whole host of therapies and, and uh, treatments to offer them. And you know, why suffer uh, alone? I think that's the biggest thing, is that suffering is so common you know, throughout all of human mm -hmm. existence. Anything we can do to reduce suffering and pain, I think we need to take that opportunity to make a difference. Well, I think that's great. Although I have to tell you, I think people have a misperception, um, and I, I think it's a pretty common misperception, that all you do is surgery or push pills. So let's first address the surgery push pills thing and then we'll move into what a visit would look like with you. Yeah, I think that's important for patients to understand that treatment is based on a spectrum of treatment. Okay. So we always start with conservative care treatment options. So patients that comes in with 
you know, acute pain or strain across their back, mm -hmm. maybe they need some physical therapy, maybe they need some guidance and some home exercises. If they're still suffering, a medication may be reasonable to introduce, and many times you'll start with an anti-inflammatory or okay. something like that. Patients that still suffer despite those conservative measures, we think are probably candidates for some type of procedure or intervention to further isolate the pain, treat it, and reduce the inflammation so that they can get back to normal function. I think at the end of the spectrum, we see mm -hmm. surgery. And there are cases where patients have tried and failed all those prior mm -hmm. treatments, and they do need to see a surgeon for a definitive evaluation. But there's a whole lot of stuff in the middle, it sounds like. Absolutely. I usually see that most patients will realize that they've got many more options ahead of them before they go under uh, the knife and have a major surgery done. So could you tell me a couple of the things that might be in the middle ground that you would be addressing? So somebody's already tried the physical therapy, they've already tried the anti-inflammatory, and then they finally go see you. Yeah. What does it look like? So I think it's important to evaluate what they've had done before, what mm -hmm. results they've had at that time, and how their pain has changed or evolved. I think we notice a lot that pain is not static. You know, it's always gonna okay. be dynamic, and pain's gonna change from time to time. So, so for example, a patient that has you know, mild knee arthritis, five, 10 years later, that knee arthritis has probably gotten worse and maybe okay. affecting them differently. And so there are different tools that we consider along that spectrum of treatment. So it may be a cortisone injection initially, but later on we may evolve to consider some other types of injections such as visco supplementation or some type of gel to help lubricate the knee. And then lastly, maybe some type of nerve block to further improve the pain. Okay. So I think of pain as on a spectrum as well as some of our interventional treatments. Usually a minimally invasive injection or treatment that we do in the office can be effective for a majority of cases. Okay. If there's pain that persists beyond that, then an advanced therapy option is still available to them and we have a whole host of those to explore. So I think you just hit some real keywords here. Minimally invasive and in your office. So people shouldn't be afraid to go see you. You're not immediately gonna go, as I say, take a hammer or a knife and cut at them or smash things. So can you give me an example of what a visit would look like? So you have a new patient coming in, they've already tried the anti-inflammatories, they've already had um, PT and OT yeah. and all of that. So what's the first thing you do with them? So we have a detailed conversation, right? We go over where their pain is coming from. The important okay. thing is to identify the source of the pain, right? So we have to be able to find the source where the, the pain is originating from, how can we best treat it, and what are the therapy options we're gonna evaluate for that. So we start with the physical examination as well. Okay. So we'll see where the pain is based on kind of our examination and identify if there are structures there that are consistent with the pain. Now those patients many times will require some type of imaging, and maybe an okay. x-ray, and maybe an MRI. And then upon review of those imaging findings, we'll take a look at what options we have available. You know, if it's a disc herniation in the back, that may respond well to an epidural steroid injection designed to help reduce inflammation around okay. the disc or the nerve. That'd be a great option to help get them moving again in which, you know, where therapy may have failed, but they'll be able to start to get back to more activity that way. That's amazing. So it sounds, not to minimize what you're doing, but it sounds like conversation, physical exam, imaging. And then that's when you start looking at what the appropriate treatment is. So people need to actually be an active participant in this. And you guys are working together to find the solution. Absolutely. And I a lot of it sounds like it's a lot easier than necessarily needing surgery. Absolutely. And we always will see patients that come in that are a little bit needle phobic and are uh -huh. a little bit hesitant regarding injections. Yep. So I usually mention injections at the end of the visit as, okay. our, as our option if things fail, if things don't go the way we want them to go, that these are other options to explore, but that we want to treat pain comprehensively. And I think that's an okay. important key factor is that when folks come to see us, we want to put all the options on the table and then find the one, right ones that are going to fit them in terms of their needs and their goals. It sounds like you've got a pretty complete toolbox to look at too. Um, we have a couple of minutes before we have to go to break. And I was wondering if you could mention one particular intervention that you would like to discuss. You can pick any from your toolbox. No preconceived notions here. What would you like? Well, I think technology has made a tremendous impact in terms okay. of our treatments. So we're using medical devices now to treat chronic pain in which prior medications or even injections may not have achieved a, a significant result. So those could be spinal cord stimulators, that can be an intrathecal pain pump, 
Um, they can even be medical devices to treat chronic nerve pain. So I think the introduction of technology has made a tremendous impact in our ability to treat pain, and I think that's where we're going to see the future. Excellent. And so when you're talking about these devices, are they big, small? I mean, is it the size of a cell phone? I'm picturing in the older days when they had a pain pump, it was, you know, the size of the brick size telephone. <laughs> so what right. size is it now? How so big are we talking about? Most of these are small, probably, this, you know, the size of either a pacemaker, if you're recognized for that, um, you know, maybe two matchboxes put together. So wow. they're minimally invasive uh, devices that can be done in an outpatient setting. So you go home same day after these implants and surgeries. But the impact on their pain and the function is long lasting. And so that's one of the, 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 the key factors that something that doesn't require a big surgery, doesn't require a big recovery, but can help pain and improve function, that's where we see success. That's amazing. I, I think people really need to know that. I mean, to paraphrase what we've been talking about is people shouldn't be afraid to go talk to you. You're not necessarily going to go after them with a hammer that's right. and <laughs> that there are options that are minimally invasive, don't necessarily require surgery, and don't necessarily require them to be taking drugs that they're all afraid of, such as opioids. I agree. There's options. I agree. And then just a point about the medications. Yes, I please. think there's been many, you know, uh, cases where folks have asked, you know, I don't want to be on a medication, I don't want to be on pain medications, or I'm taking pain medication that have side effects. Those are opportunities for us to really explore other options that may minimize their medication requirements, improve their quality of life, and reduce side effects at the same time. So I think for folks that have had pain, that maybe mm -hmm. have been on medications, maybe that's a good opportunity to meet with a pain physician and talk about what alternatives do they have. And I think right. in the present state of the opiate crisis, we always need to reevaluate these other tools. I think that's something worth repeating. There is an opioid crisis, there are alternatives, and someone like you can actually address the pain and address the opioid crisis and treat somebody without necessarily using the opioids. I agree. If there are options. I agree. You know, why put a band-aid on it when we can try to fix the underlying problem? That's huge. I'm really glad to hear you say that. I think there are a lot of people who are suffering needlessly. So um, we need to head into a break right now. And when we come back, I hope we can talk a little bit more about a pain pump. Absolutely. Great. Everybody, thank you so much. We'll be right back after this break. This is your Need to Know, and I'm your host, Jody Lyons. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is gonna help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Mom! I got it. What are you doing in there? Like, what's up? Oh. Are you a dog? I wouldn't do that. Have you seen the pliers? Where'd you find those? It's not your birthday. Sorry. I'll never forget the day our landlord called and said, read your lease. No pets allowed. My owner tells him my dog ate the lease, but that didn't work. And now I'm stuck in a shelter, but this pit bull is ready for a new crib. I'm loving, loyal, and play well with others. So don't be intimidated by all my muscles, because the biggest one I have is my heart. <laughs> That's right, I said it.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Once again, I'm your host, Jody Lyons, and this is Your Need to Know. My guest today is Dr. Jasmine Brar, and he is an affiliated physician with National Spine and Pain. And so we were talking a little bit during the break, and I need to ask you a pretty basic question. So we used the word interventional pain specialist. Can you explain the difference between that and regular pain doctor to me? What do you do? No, that's a great question, and it's a very important distinguishing. For patients that come in to see a pain doctor, they may see a doctor that sees chronic pain conditions, may prescribe physical therapy, may okay. prescribe medications, but may not offer the different interventions and procedures that we would do um, as an interventional pain physician. And so we are specially trained to provide different types of procedures, injections, and some minimally invasive surgeries to treat chronic pain conditions. So the difference really is like the injections and the minimally invasive procedures, like the one we're about to talk about in a minute, which is a pain pump. But that's really the difference. So there's more active intervention as opposed to straight treatment. Absolutely, we'll take okay. it to the next level of treatment. So for most patients, if they do well with the initial couple of tiers of therapy and treatment, that's great. But we okay. take our options to those higher levels of therapy when that time comes. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks for clarifying that. Now, originally we were going to talk about in this segment, a pain pump. Does that still work for you to talk about? Absolutely. Okay. So let's start with a really basic question, which is what is a pain pump and what does it do? Great. So a pain pump is essentially a simple reservoir, which is a medical device that contains okay. medication. And typically it's some type of opioid medication such as morphine or hydromorphone. And the whole concept behind a pain pump is that it delivers that medication directly to the site of action of, of the pain medication. So in the pain receptors that sit within our spinal cord, within our brain, and so for patients that have had chronic pain for years and years and years, they may have been on pain medications orally, and that mm -hmm. medication may have resulted in either side effects or may have stopped working. And so when you take a medication by mouth, that medication has to go to our liver, has to get metabolized, has to get processed, and has to go through our systemic circulation to mm -hmm. get to the site of action, which is actually in our spinal cord and our brain. And so by doing a pain pump, we actually bypass all of those processing uh, steps and deliver oh. medication directly to where it needs to go. So it's not going through the whole body, it's just going where it needs to go. Right. It's like that sounds a lot simpler. It's like taking the toll road. Right. You know, I like straight that. to the pain. So okay. um, I think for patients that are looking into a, what's called a, a pain pump or intrathecal therapy, mm -hmm. they have to consider that this is something that's going to change the way they're going to be treated in terms of their pain forever. Right. This is a therapy that can be life changing for many patients whether they have chronic degenerative disc disease in the spine, whether they've had prior surgery on their spine and still had pain, or whether they just have you know, chronic pain due to diffuse pain throughout their body from multiple conditions, from autoimmune conditions, or even osteoarthritis. Um, oh, okay. So it's been an evolving therapy that we've seen over the past several years. Um, interesting enough, um, it started back in the late 1980s where we were using intrathecal pain pumps to treat cancer pain. That's, I didn't realize it's been a long, around that long. And so what I'm picturing is somebody with pain pushing those buttons to get more morphine when they're in the hospital. Is that the old style? Correct. So okay, so I'm picturing something old. So that's right. what you get when you're in the hospital, when you okay. have a surgery, you need to have some immediate access to pain medication. The same concept can be translated to the pain pump where you have this reservoir of medication that's um, implanted typically in the abdomen with a small tubing or catheter that's tunneled towards the spinal sac where the medication is delivered. Okay. Okay. So all, every, all the components of the pump are internal. So that's one of the benefits that you can have access to pain medication wherever you need it but typically at a much lower dose. So patients that are on pain pump therapy require a fraction of the dose that they would require orally. Because, they because it's bypassing everything exactly. else and going right where it needs to be. Exactly. So, so you can use a lower dose. You lose a lower dose. Okay. And you have tremendous flexibility in the dosing. So a patient that may have a slip and fall and have some increased pain as a result of that can give themselves an extra dose and we can program those doses in there. So it's going to be a, a very um, important relationship between the doctor and the patient to determine 
what type of pain pump therapy they would benefit from, how we would implement it, and how we can program it to best fit their needs. Okay, here's the next question. How big is this thing that you would implant? So it's a little bit larger than the size of a hockey puck. So okay. it's, uh, it's about uh, big enough that you'd probably feel it on the abdomen. It sits just about a couple centimeters underneath the skin. Sometimes we place it in the back as well, okay. depending on the patient's anatomy. But usually after the first couple of months, folks don't notice it as much. So okay. it's typically not a painful um, implant to have. And over time, the pump can be refilled about every three months or so with new medication. So typically patients see us about every uh, three or four months as needed for a medication refill and an adjustment to the pump. So, But that means they can go three or four months without needing to see you. That's I kind of look at it that way. No offense to the doctor. That's but, right. <laughs> you know, we don't want to spend all of our time in the doctor's office. I think that's so important. I think I've seen patients find freedom in mm -hmm. life again. Um, many times if you are taking a controlled substance such as an opioid medication, you have to go to the pharmacy every month. Yeah. And every month you have to get that medication filled. Many times if the pharmacy does not have the medication, now you're waiting right. two, three days, maybe yeah. a week to get your medication filled. And that can be a tremendous strain, not on your schedule, but just on family and, and life overall. And then say if you wanted to go for a vacation somewhere, you have to plan your vacations around your medication Exactly, fill. And, and they're not gonna refill in advance with most of those drugs. Correct, so patients that have transitioned to intrafecal drug delivery or a pain pump find that they can travel for maybe three or four months and not That's have to worry amazing. about coming back into the pharmacy because they have the pharmacy with them. So how do you actually refill the reservoir? So the reservoir is actually filled either by feel. We can feel that there is a small dimple in the center of the pump that has a, a port which can be accessed similar to a, a Mediport that some patients may have during chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So it's done through the skin after we numb up the skin with a little bit of lidocaine. Um, typically it's not painful and it takes about five, ten minutes. So we put a new medication wow. in there and we update the pump settings to find out what works for them. We will change the settings if they have any increased pain or we can dial it down. And so it's a constant uh, little bit of uh, tweaking that occurs with these patients that have these medications and they find that it works really well for them. And is it a continual flow or is it, you know, again, I'm still stuck with your thumb on the pain pump kind of thing. So how does that work when it's home and it's implanted? That's a great question. So it's a little bit of both. It really depends on the patient's needs. Okay. There are some patients that do well with a small basal rate, so okay. a small continuous rate of medication that they just needed to get through their day. It's working when they sleep, it's working when they're awake. And there are some patients that require more flexible dosing. Okay. Say they're gonna be going for their afternoon walk and maybe they need a little bit of extra medication to help them go for a little bit, that extra mile sure. if you will. And so they can dial in that extra dosing as needed. Um, one of the other things I want to mention about pain pumps is yes. that patients actually will get a chance to try what the therapy would feel like before they actually get the implantation. Oh, so how does that work? So I think many people- I'm totally <laughs> puzzled by this. I think, okay, walking around with like, you know, a <laughs> Diet Coke cup or something. That's yeah? right, that's right. So it's interesting because, you know, in the surgical realm, you can't try a lot of things before you get it done. Right. And so well, this is one of the therapies that actually you get a sense of what the medication would feel like. So we have our patients will come into our clinic and they will get an injection with that same pain medication that we would put in the pump. Okay. And we would inject it directly in towards the spinal sac and have the effect of what it would feel like if you were to have it infused. Oh. And those patients come in without taking any of their normal medications and would see what it would feel like to have a pain pump infusion for that day. And so typically within a couple hours, they'll know that difference. How long does it take for, like, let's say you get the injection. How long would it take for that injection to take effect? Usually it's quite quick. So within 15, 20 minutes, you may start to see the effects, but it may last for a couple hours for some patients. Wow. So they may find in the morning that after that test injection, they were able to walk longer. They didn't have the severe pain that they had normally. They didn't require any medications that they would normally take. And so that would be a sign of a successful injection. That's amazing. Now, what kind of a patient would you consider this for? So this can be used for any patient that has chronic pain that has persisted despite conservative management okay. or treatment. So this could be a patient that's had back pain for years. This could be a patient that's had back pain and back surgery that still persisted. Or a patient that's been on chronic opioid therapy for a cancer diagnosis. Okay could be from osteoporosis or uh, uh, osteo, uh, 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 sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, 
joint relative <laughs> joint disease. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, and so it can be from multiple areas that you can you can treat it from. Um, the cancer pain therapy has been one of the unique aspects that we've looked at for because that's what it started and was really created and designed for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, arthritis throughout the body, cancer, chronic, chronic, chronic back pain, things like that. I have what may sound like a bizarre question, but does it have the same kind of cognitive effects that an opioid would? So typically less so. So those oh, because the okay. dose is, is a fraction of the dose that you take by mouth, typically patients are less sedated, they have less constipation, and usually find that they're not feeling as medicated as they would normally so would be. So they're not having as much brain fog or cognitive issues. Correct. Correct. That is absolutely amazing. And so what is the technical term? I've been using the word pain pump. What word would you use? Typically we call it intrathecal drug delivery. Can you tell me that first word again? Intrathecal is the site where we put the medication goes. Drug delivery is the system that we use to deliver okay. medication. And again, it's about the size of a hockey puck. It's not this enormous brick. Correct. Okay. The, the size of the pumps have, has decreased over time significantly. That's amazing. Um, and the surgery itself is a same day surgery. So you're home you know, that day um, and recovery time is quite minimal for these types of surgeries. So not as extensive of a surgery that some folks would imagine well, that's what I think people are picturing. I think people are picturing surgery, surgery, and they're gonna be laid up for two or three weeks, and this is apparently not the case. That's right, exactly. We want them up and active, we want them functioning. And so typically, once the medication is infused, they start to notice the effects quite quickly. That is wonderful. I really appreciate this. And Dr. Brar, I really hope people will be coming to see you in your rest and office of National Spine and Pain. You're one of their affiliated physicians. And again, we did talk a lot about pain pumps. You obviously do a lot of other interventional procedures, but I really appreciate your being here. And do you have any last words for the audience? Well, thank you for having me. I think for all our listeners and, and potential patients mm -hmm. out there that want to come see us, um, please don't hesitate. You know, I think any pain, whether it's small, whether it's large, it's a good opportunity for us to have a chat and discuss what options that we can help improve quality of life and function, um, you know, for every patient out there. That makes a lot of sense. And, and again, I appreciate your being here. Once again, I'm Jody Lyons. Thank you for joining us at your Need to Know.